Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, UAS Mapping and Survey, Direct Georeferencing and LIDAR, sponsored by Aplanix, Inside GNSS, and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be hearing from our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they address the state of the art and science in direct georeferencing and LIDAR. Now, I'd like to turn today's webinar over to our moderator, General Jim Poss. General Poss is the Chief Executive Officer of ISR Ideas, an intelligence, unmanned aerial systems, and cyber warfare consulting firm. I want to thank General Poss for joining us again for today's event. General Poss? Let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Lewis Graham. And Lewis is the President and Chief Technical Officer of GeoQ Group, a group of companies whose foci are LIDAR tools and consulting, sensor processing workflow management, point cloud exploitation, and small UAS mapping systems. So over to you, Lewis. Tell us some more details about how LIDAR actually works. All right. Thank you, General Poss. So I get the privilege of being able to address you on an overview of LIDAR, uh, a little bit of structure from motion, and then my thoughts on where we're going in the future, which is anybody's guess, but um, I'll give you my opinion on it. LIDAR is actually a very simple technology, so fortunately the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant regardless of the speed of the emitting platform. That's really an amazing fact, and we take advantage of that in LIDAR. So we just send out a pulse of LIDAR, we wait for it to come back to the sensor, and we measure the time that it took. Now, light travels about 30 centimeters in one nanosecond, 10 to the ninth second, so it's really all about excellent timing. How good of a clock do we have in the system to do this timing? A single pulse is interesting, and we could do profiling with that, but to really get a nice footprint on the ground over an area that we're interested in mapping or finding elevation model for, we need to sweep the beam around, and we can do that with a moving mirror or with a moving prism. I'm often asked the question, why laser? Why can't we just use uh, ordinary light? Laser really has two principles which are really advantageous for measurements. The first is spatial coherency. So the low, we have low beam divergence, meaning it spreads out at a very gradual rate as uh, we increase the distance from the sensor. So we today routinely fly LIDARs at, say, 20,000 feet imaging uh, the ground and get uh, valid returns from that. And the second good property of lasers is that they're temporally coherent. That means that we can send out a very short pulse and keep that pulse uh, together. All modern LIDAR systems collect energy uh, over time as that energy is returned to the sensor. So at the bottom of this uh, picture, you can see a histogram where we're measuring the energy return with respect to time. So the horizontal axis is time. And where we have a large amount of energy being returned, we say, ah, this energy must be reflecting from something out in object space. Now, we can either determine uh, that something or these pulses within the hardware platform, or we can do it in software. We can pass the entire waveform over to software and do an, a post-acquisition uh, analysis. And these sensors are typically called full waveform devices. Well, we've got this laser, we shoot it down to the ground, we get energy back, we histogram it, we can see pulses, and all that's very interesting. But if we do not know which way the system is pointing, we've got a problem. And so this is where Planix comes in. We need a very precise position system, that is X, Y, and Z, where are we located? And we also need to know in great detail the orientation of the system, or high accuracy and resolution, pitch, yaw, and roll. And we do this with systems that combine um, GNSS, with inertial measurement units, and typically that combination is called a position and orientation system. And here I've got a picture in the lower right of an Aplanix system used for this type of application. We also need to know where that mirror or that uh, revolving prism is located, and so we have an encoder on the mirror or prism. We show a mirror in this particular illustration that also tells us where that is. So we have to combine an awful lot of information, uh, position, orientation, mirror angle, etc for a laser beam sweeping the ground, and when we resolve all of those components, we can map the uh, object space that we're imaging, say the terrain, at very high levels of accuracy. So at, at pretty high altitudes, 15 centimeters of vertical accuracy, is uh, that's an old spec. Actually, the new USGS spec for vertical accuracy is better than 10 centimeters on what we call 
QL2 uh, data. So this is quite remarkable accuracy that we're getting from a moving platform. Uh, as you saw in General Pasa's image, we, we really get these very realistic images that are returned by the system. So if we look at this, which is just an intensity image, uh, we can see where we get the imaging part of LIDAR. Here we have uh, a grayscale image of an area that's been um, recorded on the ground, and we could use this type, type of image for planimetric mapping. We can easily trace out roads and other features in this type of uh, reflected image. We usually do a lot more processing on LIDAR data, for example, classification. This is not classification in the DOD sense, but classification in the sense of categorizing points into the object space that they represent. So here I've got buildings in red, I've got vegetation in green, I've got the ever important ground surface, which is used for floodplain modeling and so forth, in orange. And you can see a little bit of water in the, uh, uh, the right-hand side here. Modern LIDAR systems, as we, as we saw earlier, have the ability to record the energy that's returned from a pulse with respect to time, so that if we have closely spaced objects, as you see the branches on this tree, for example, we can get a bit of return energy from the top of the tree, a bit more from this bush underneath the tree, and then finally some more energy from the ground. And these multiple returns are often called echoes, or simply re discrete returns from the LIDAR system. And these are invaluable for recognizing what it is that we're seeing in object space. Am I seeing a visually opaque uh, uh, particle in object space? Am I seeing something that is transparent, et cetera, trees versus buildings and so forth? So here I've taken some data from a mapping mission in, in uh, Bushnell County, Florida. And you see, you can clearly see the vegetation or trees, and you can see the ground in the lower part of the image. And I've color-coded these um, points by the echo. So the cyan points were first returns, the, um, yeah, some of the magenta points and yellow points on the ground are later returns. Here I filtered out and said, hey, just show me the returns that represent one of many. So there were other returns, but I only want to look at the first one, and that's obviously vegetation. So here we have a really simple algorithm that says, show me the points that reflected from vegetation. All right, let's move on from that introduction of LIDAR to a really a competing technology in drone space, which is to take images from different perspectives. This is quite like the stereo imagery that uh, General Poss referred to. If I take pictures from more than two locations, I do what is called multi-ray photogrammetry, and through an algorithm called structure from motion, I can determine the location that the camera was when it took each one of these photographs, and this process is completely automated gives us pretty good results. So here I have uh, a picture that, or an area that we flew of a mine site, uh, or actually this is a paper mill, and you see a wood chip pile that's used as feeder stock to their process, and their uh, application was volumetric analysis. So I think you can see from these images, I have a map view to, in the upper left, a 3D view in the upper right, and in the lower uh, section of this image, I've cut a profile, which is this white line that you see through the main image. And you can see quite remarkable definition. Mm, looks perfect. Why do I need LIDAR? Well, all is not good with structure from motion. The first thing is, is that you have to have, you have to be able to see the object space from multiple camera positions. So if I have heavy vegetation, I can't see the ground from multiple camera positions. And when I do structure from motion over an area such as the forest that I'm showing here, you can see that I'm just catching the canopy. And you can do some further analysis and find out that not only am I only seeing the canopy, but that canopy isn't even at the right elevation because of some correlator errors that occur. So that, there's a bad thing about it. Can't use it for vegetation. Uh, a second thing is, is that you can get a lot of occlusions when you have to have multiple perspectives looking at object space. So here I've got an example of an image in an urban area where I'm trying to look down between houses. And you can see that I have a lot of voids. I have some trees that are causing that canopy problem we mentioned earlier. And what I've done is I've color-coded this inset image in magenta in all of the areas where I have voids, that is, where I have no 3D elevation. Hmm. So this technique would not be very useful for urban areas. A third thing I'd like to... Uh, mentioned that I don't have an image of here is that you also cannot detect wires with structures from motion. So if you're going to do transmission line modeling, forget it, you're going to have to have LIDAR. You won't be able to use structure from motion. So really great for bare earth mine site applications and those sorts of things, 
uh, can't be beat. But if you have uh, situations like I've illustrated here, LiDAR is going to definitely be the better choice. Uh, here's an example that we ran into on one of our mine sites where we were imaging a mine site with a stockpile covered in vegetation. The magenta points are where we did survey with uh, a GPS uh, rover, what you might call pogo surveying. And in the lower view, you see where the actual elevation is with these magenta points, but what the structure from motion gave us um, in the model. So again, just an illustration of the limitation of this type of technology. Great technology, but you have to use it in the right place. Let's move on and look at the future a little bit and what we see coming down the pike in terms of LIDAR. In the left-hand side is illustrated a scanning LIDAR, and that's the technology that I talked about at the beginning of this um, talk on LIDAR, where we're just scanning and we're picking up individual points. We do do a very high rate. We might do uh, 500,000 points per second, for example, but nevertheless, I'm imaging single points. A new technique is to use a flash LIDAR that is a LIDAR that is not so coherent, that I, or not so uh, divergent. I let it diverge a bit. I illuminate a larger spot, and now I collect the reflection on an array, very much like a CCD camera, for example. So I have a sensor with multiple sensing elements on it and a single laser. And these are called focal plane array laser systems. Uh, let's back off a little bit and talk about detecting light in low uh, light conditions. So there's a real desire in the LIDAR world to be able to fly at higher and higher altitudes, and that means I have less and less energy coming back. So I need a technique by which I can discriminate and find that energy. And so the idea there is to do something called an avalanche. I have a single event that comes in, say a photon comes in and ionizes an electron, that electron ionizes other electrons and there's an amplification that occurs in this avalanche type event. I can do that in solid state through a device called an avalanche photo detector. I can run that detector in different modes that run from an ordinary photodiode to linear mode, um, avalanche photo detector. So this would be where I really want to see the intensity that's coming back not quite as sensitive. Or I can run it in this avalanche mode and it will just trip over. And as I get single photons in, I get a nice pulse of energy that says, ah, I, I don't know the brightness of the ground, but I know it's there or whatever object it is I happen to image. So if we look at the summary of all of this, what do we have? Well, the big advantage of LIDAR is only a single ray is required for modeling in 3D object space. This is a huge advantage over photogrammetry and really the driver behind the invention of LIDAR. Uh, modern LIDAR scanning systems, are they're proven. So manned aircraft systems, very high resolution, precision, and accuracy. The largest contributor today to high accuracy is a very high quality position and orientation system. So this is where uh, a Planix comes in and the reason why you must have that technology to be successful. Uh, miniature, miniaturization is well on the way and we can put these devices on drones. Coming down the pipe, uh, Geiger mode sensors, although we still have a big noise problem to deal with. And frankly, I believe the focal plane array LIDARs, probably five years out, huge driver for them because this is the technology that will be used in self-driving automobiles for navigation.